Okay, I see we have attendees trickling in. So we'll give them, okay, we'll give them about a minute for people to start coming in. I see we have, we're getting people coming in now. Welcome to those of you who are coming in right now. For those of you who are coming in right now, feel free to sit up front first. Sit down. <laughs> Have you been the co-host like this for all the other Zoom programs? Um, not, uh, it depends. Mostly for the Survivor Talks, I I do the hosting and a couple other ones. Um, but we all sort of take turns depending on what the program is. It looks like we have about 11 attendees so far. We're waiting on about 10 to 15 more. So welcome everyone. While everybody's trickling in, um, I'll briefly repeat this once we have everyone in, but um, for those of you who are here already, I just wanna welcome you and just let you know that this is my virtual background. I'm not actually here. This is the Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust. Um, some of you might have been here in the past. I'm sure some of the teachers here have been here before. Um, we're the first Holocaust survivor founded Holocaust Museum in the United States. So this means we were established by a group of Holocaust survivors in the 1960s. And the survivors who built this museum did this at a time when nobody wanted to hear about the Holocaust. It was too painful and the world wasn't really ready to learn about it yet. Nonetheless, this group of survivors worked together and they established what became this museum that you can see behind me. And they always had a mission to educate, commemorate, and inspire the future generations. Unfortunately, the museum is closed for the time being, um, as are most other public places and museums. Nonetheless, thanks to technology, we can still fulfill the same mission and thanks to your teachers um, who are, you know, working with us, we're able to provide you this experience right now, this virtual Holocaust survivor talk through Zoom. So we thank you for being here and thanks to the teachers. We'll just give it like another minute or so.
Okay, everybody, welcome to this virtual program from Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust. Um, today, you have the honor and privilege of listening to Suzanne Reto, a Holocaust survivor from Hungary, and she will share her story with you. And during her talk, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A box. Um, you are all muted already, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, but you can use the Q&A box to ask questions and Suzanne will have access to the box and she'll answer them um, while, while she speaks. So without further ado, I'm happy to welcome Suzanne Reto. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, thank you so much for having me and uh, welcome young people, parents, teachers, and anyone who is listening. And I just want you to know that this is my first uh, Zoom experience like this because I'm used to speaking at the museum where the youngsters are in front of me and I see their faces, see their reactions, and it's a little different. This way I have to do my own inspirations and uh, I just want you to know that at any time when you have a question, feel free to ask and I will look over there and see if I can uh, find it and answer them for you. I would just like to give you a little background uh, because you may be wondering, I am perhaps a little younger than you might expect. I am what you call a child survivor. I was born during the Holocaust and you may be wondering how I am here to tell you all about it. Well, my grandson had asked me after they learned Anne Frank's diary in school, he asked me to see if I would come and speak to his classroom and uh, tell them all about my experience. Well, at that point, of course, I was excited to speak to his class and I was thrilled that my grandson would ask me. However, I felt inadequate in my knowledge base for the very first year or two of my life. And I had to ask my mother for filling in the answers and the information. It may seem strange, but I had great deal of trepidations and reluctance to ask because my parents have always told me, we don't look back, we don't dwell on the bad, we always look forward and look forward to the next day for a better day if there are problems. So I wasn't sure how my mother would feel that I will ask her to reopen her closed wounds and have her tell me all about uh, the time just before my birth and maybe the first year or two. Because I was an only child, I must tell you, my memories go back way, way as a little girl and uh, I have very vivid memories, some of them not so pleasant. So I want you to know that whatever I tell you from the beginning is really through my mother's voice and almost firsthand information. And the reason is that as a result of that speaking to the classrooms for my grandson, which turned out to be not just one classroom, but an all day affair of six different classrooms, and the youngsters in their Q and A said something very meaningful. They asked me if I will write a book so that their siblings who are younger and don't read yet would be able to um, read the same stories. And this is when my book came out called Pursuit of Freedom. And for that as well, I had to ask my mother to help me fill in some of the missing information. So with this, uh, I now will begin and also tell you that I am aware that you probably have very little Holocaust education. I would like to tell you about the Holocaust, but I find it important to uh, make young people aware that the Holocaust was something we had no uh, choice in and we had no control over. We had to endure, overcome, and then survive. And my message is that we survived, we overcame these incredible atrocities. And here we are many, many years later, I'm speaking to you and sharing my story. I think it's also important to have that information in context for today 
and what transpired in the last 70 years. Because one thing that is kind of a misnomer, a lot of people say that uh, evil ended at the end of World War II. Well, I'm sorry, I beg to differ with those people because I will share with you the stories of my life and my upbringing because mine didn't end with the World War II ending. I continued under the communist era in Hungary. So you will not only get Holocaust history, a little bit of European history, and then to share the greatness of this wonderful country and how lucky and fortunate we are to be living here. So let's start. I was born in 1944, just six days prior to the Nazi invasion of Hungary. And you may be, or we will be aware that Hungary was the last country to be occupied. It was the, practically the end of the war, the last year of the war. So at that point, the Nazi machinery, their killing machine was very well uh, designed and very, very well run. So they could do a lot of damage in a short period of time. My mother was alone. And in those days, mother stayed in the hospital for about a week after childbirth. And um, my father was already not uh, around with my mother because he was conscripted into the Hungarian military, which at that point already was um, somewhat Nazi controlled because the Hungarians were um, allies of the Germans. And just so that you may be wondering, who were these Nazis? Nazism developed in starting in 1933 when Hitler came to power and conditions politically and financially were not great. So people were willing to listen and wanted help from others. And Hitler was an incredible orator and he could speak beautifully, loudspeakers and all of that. So he was able to convince people and also he wanted to have a pure Aryan race in Germany. To this, he tried many different ways, one of which was that he was able to convince the people that Jews, Jewish people are not the race he wants to be mingled with. And he wanted the blue-eyed blonde Aryan race, so-called pure race. So he did a lot of things and as you know, the Nazi era really began in earnest in 1939, 38, 39, going from various countries. And since communication was not the same then as it is today, the Hungarians knew rumblings were going on in Europe, but they had no idea what really all that meant. So on the day of March 19th, my mother was in the hospital and uh, there was great commotion. Nobody knew what was happening, what was going on, and nobody was willing to speak. By the end of the day, she was frantic and she was able to finally corner a nurse who was willing to speak and said, the Germans invaded Hungary that morning. And as if that wasn't bad enough, believe it or not, they established their headquarters on the grounds of the hospital. Well, you can imagine this is all a brand new mother of a six day old baby needed to hear and all she could imagine, will we be able to get out of there? And if yes, how? She had been staying with her parents because as I said, my father wasn't around anymore. So she wondered if we'll ever be able to get to her parents' home so we can get out of the hospital and get away from it. Well, as if an angel from heaven, her doctor walked in and he reassured her and said, I know what happened today and I know your circumstances, your husband not being around. I've arranged for an ambulance tomorrow to take you home to your parents' home. And this incredible doctor not only arranged for the ambulance, 
but he said, I also made arrangements for a sign, infectious disease. And if you can imagine, perhaps you're wondering, what did that mean? Well, nobody wants to be near anybody who has an infectious disease or a car with infectious disease people in it. So they absolutely let us go through and uh, we just sailed through and went home to my grandparents. Well, we arrived next day, thank God, thanks to the incredible effort of my mother's doctor, and uh, we were saved. That was my first attempt at survival at age seven days. So you know that survivorship is part of my vocabulary and I use it a lot because I am never a victim, I'm always a survivor. And I want you to be sure that you take away from today that you have to take responsibility but also work for your own self. You cannot depend on anyone else to do it for you. Although, as many times, there are lots and lots of bad people, there are plenty of good doers, and if you have an opportunity, always try to do good for others. It will come back to reward you. So this happened, this was the very beginning of communist, of a Nazi era in Hungary. And actually nobody knew what was going on except uh, uh, uniformed, Nazi uniformed uh, soldiers were running around and shootings were going on and everybody was scared, not knowing anything what to do. You must remember that by then there was a shortage of food. There wasn't much because people were not doing too much processing and getting food was much more difficult than you can imagine today. We did not have supermarkets. We had little shops for everything, a bakery for bread products, a milk store, a dairy store for milk and cheese and eggs, a green grocer for fruits and vegetables, and all these different uh, products had to be gotten in different places. So going shopping was a major effort. And uh, things were in short supply. And unfortunately, uh, one of the first things the German did in Hungary, and as I said, this was not so enforced in other countries because the Germans were learning with each country. However, in Hungary, they were very well informed and very aware, and they enforced a law of having to wear a yellow star. The yellow star is a four inch yellow star that had to be worn on your heart. And anybody who was outside on the street had to wear it. And this was an identifier and not a very pleasant one. So we were somewhat discriminated. I must say maybe not even somewhat, but a great deal discriminated. And life was getting more and more difficult every day. And as always with a new uh, rule or law, things are not as strict at the beginning as they grow to become such. So things were getting more and more difficult. Food supply was less and less and shorter and shorter and everything you had to stand in line for. Well, things were difficult as you can imagine living with my grandparents, a brand new baby. And in those days, mothers nursed. So if there was no food, a mother didn't have enough food to produce milk. Consequently, there wasn't enough to nurse. So many times my mother said that starvation was one of the ways and uh, unfortunately there was nothing she could do. And instead of milk, it was often water that supplemented the feeding. This was getting worse and worse, more and more difficult, but we all had to endure it. Then the next major thing that happened, in the middle of May, Eichmann, Adolf Eichmann, who was one of Hitler's henchmen, came to Hungary for laborers. And you may be wondering, but the Nazi regime was into building, and they needed lots and lots of building materials. They had several brick factories. 
and they also were in the ammunition business to produce ammunition to kill people with. So the shortage of workers, Eichmann came and wanted to gather the Jewish population of Hungary. They first started with the countryside because they knew that people will not have the opportunity to run away anywhere. So they gathered the people and after a certain a number of people were gathered, they had what they called a sorting system. And the sorting was that they had two lines, one on the left, one on the right, and everybody had to line up. And if you were in good health, you went to one line, young and able to work. And if you were older, not so well, and children went to the right. Well, all of these people, according to their line designation, were shipped in cattle cars to Auschwitz. Auschwitz was one of the most notorious death camps. And you might be wondering the difference, you've heard the name concentration camp or death camp. Concentration camps were the ones that did not have a killing machinery, but death camps were the ones where they had um, gas chambers, and to follow that up, they had crematorium. So that's the difference between a concentration camp and a death camp. So believe it or not, starting in the middle of May, they had two, three train runs from these smaller places to take these Jewish people of Hungary to Auschwitz. This went on after they gathered the whole countryside and emptied out the country from Jewish people. They came to the city of Budapest where they also went street by street to collect as many people as they needed. Believe it or not, they were very systematic and they didn't get to everywhere. Uh, interestingly, where my husband's family lived was a little further out from the central area, so they never actually reached his street. So just to finish up the Budapest gathering, they gathered all the Hungarian Jews of uh, the countryside and then the city and between the middle of May and the beginning of July, they shipped 600,000 Jewish people from Hungary to Auschwitz. If you can imagine, at the beginning of the war, this could never have been done because they would not have been this efficient. By now, they were very well run, very organized, and this enormous number of people in such a short time could be shipped. Well, as you can imagine, things were difficult. And once these people were gone, then family members were distraught and things were very problematic. But thanks to the help of some, again, very, very unusual, decent humanitarians, things were a little easier. Starting like the beginning of April, there was a, a, a consul general from Switzerland, who was an amazing ambassador to Palestine prior to coming to Hungary. And he was aware of some of the situations and some of the worldly travel and consequences of perhaps his good deeds. So he came up and devised a system of designating the Hungarian Jews who were left in Budapest to give them a paper, a Swiss paper, called a Schutzpass. The translation of it is uh, strictly a protective paper. And that would designate the Hungarian Jews to be Swiss citizens. Now this was an amazing uh, opportunity for people to get these papers to save themselves. In addition, at the same time, he also designated certain buildings to be what they were called protected houses. They also had a star of their country. And the, when the German hoodlums came to check out people, they, if you showed them a paper, they accepted it. They were very law abiding. And if you showed that you were a Swiss citizen or you had some Swiss connection, you were left alone. Fortunately, my mother had one of these 
So she felt a little more secure. And when they had to go to, uh, to places, they were somewhat feeling better and secure about just their being. However, they never knew how long that will last. But you know what? Anything for today was better than nothing. So uh, this went on. And once it got to be May and June, things were really more problematic and family members were distraught who were left behind. But we just had to manage. And food supply was getting even more difficult. Less and less food was available. And by then, unfortunately, since not only Jewish people went to the little shops, the local Gentile community as well, if you had a yellow star on, you were sent to the back of the line and often by the time you got to the top of the line, there was nothing left. So starvation often set in and it was not easy. Uh, I'm just wondering, does anyone have any questions? I don't want to keep on going. I want to do, have a few questions answered if you have any. And by the way, thinking that we are at home, perhaps teachers and parents will also be there to ask questions. Feel free to ask them. Mothers and dads are just as welcome as the students or teachers. So this was uh, the middle of July and things were getting more and more difficult. And the middle of July, we were lucky again. The Swedish government sent an emissary, the a consul general called Raoul Wallenberg to Hungary to help out and saving more of the Jewish community of Hungary. There's a huge difference between the first man that I told you, whose name was Karl Lutz, L-U-T-Z, and Raoul Wallenberg. Karl Lutz did it against the wishes of his country because of the goodness of his heart. And you must also remember, just like today, Switzerland was a neutral country, and perhaps that was the reason why they didn't sanction his acts of uh, grace and acts of uh, savior. But by the middle of July, when the Swedish government sent Raoul Wallenberg, it was really another godsend. And he established the same issuing of Schutzpass, the protective papers, and the protected houses. Now, if you had the opportunity, like my mother was fortunate enough because her brother acted like a gopher for both the Swedish and the Swiss legation, the consulate, and she had both papers. So when the Germans came and checked up, what are we doing and what's going on, she handed one of them, and if the Germans took them, she at least had another one left for the next time. You must remember that there were approximately 10,000 real Schutzpass issued originals, but the uh, consul general had given to a group of underground youth group the actual papers, and these youngsters were able to duplicate actually so incredibly that nobody knew the difference between the real and the forgery. So this really played an enormous uh, role in the Nazi invasion because it threw off the German occupation because instead of having just maybe 10,000, there were close to 100,000 of these issued, if you can imagine. Okay, I now see questions, excuse me, I'll hold on. And let me see if I can get them. Uh, please forgive me for a second till I read. Okay, incredible questions. Um, the first one was, when you were little, did you understand what was happening? Well, of course, as a baby, I didn't understand. And I, you, I was a year, uh, almost a year old before the war ended. So lots of things right at that moment, I did not understand. And that's why I made sure that you knew that what I'm telling you is actually from my mother's mouth. And if you have a chance to uh, see the book, Pursuit of Freedom, you'll have a chance to see that 
my mother's voice comes directly and uh, her uh, voice is said firsthand so it isn't like information handed down generation to generation. So I didn't know. The next one was, did they give you a tattoo? Well, tattoos were given uh, to people in mainly Auschwitz and also in some of the other camps that you had to be in those camps in order to have a tattoo. And you probably know the tattoo is on the left uh, arm and all of those were tattooed the minute they arrived. Interestingly, to add a little bit more to the evil of what the Nazis did, people were tattooed only if they went to the working line, the line that was going to stay alive. Because the moment people arrived in Auschwitz, they were separated to the working line and the old and not so well line. The ones in the not so well line the moment they arrived, they were immediately marched to the gas chamber and to their deaths. So only the ones who were to stay alive and work and be as slaves were the ones who were tattooed. And um, that's really interestingly, they didn't want to waste the ink on those who were not going to stay alive. Can you imagine? Hard to believe. The next one is, did you get sent to a camp? Well, we did not get sent to a camp. And in a minute, I will tell you what was the next step that could have been a camp experience. But just to go back to the original, um, uh, the uh, life was getting more and more difficult and food was in less and less supply. And everybody was afraid to go outside because the bombs were falling, shot gunshots were sounding all over, and it was really difficult. And sometimes people had to make uh, a decision whether they would go out and look for food or they would want to be staying inside and make sure that they stayed alive because the bombs were coming not knowing from where. How old the question? How old were you when you understood what was happening? Well, that's a very interesting question. Since I was an only child and spent a great deal of time with my parents, I understood a lot of things very early. My parents never um, sent me to another room or, and of course, I was a baby at the first year, but later on when I was able to be part of the social scene to be with my parents. I was always allowed to listen in. And whenever I asked questions, they answered as briefly as they could, but I always got an answer. So I would say probably by the time I was three years old, I was tuning into the conversations and I had an inkling. Of course, the magnitude of it, I couldn't understand because you have to be an adult to get the uh, the gist of it and to get the meaning of those days. But I would say probably starting around three years old, I was able to be very much part of it. And I will tell you my personal experiences firsthand because unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm not sure, I do remember a great deal. And because my parents always kept me aware and they allowed me to be part of it, I knew more than most youngsters at that stage would have known. So let's see, there's another question. Did you hear gunshots all the time, all day? Yes, there were gunshots all day and you just didn't know where from, how or how to avoid. As a matter of fact, my mother told the story that one day she was in a second story apartment sitting with me in the corner next to an interior wall. And moments later, out of the blue, a gunshot hit the exterior wall and it fell away. As we were sitting in the corner, we were opened up to the street. And if we took a step too far out, 
we would have been falling onto the street. So these were things that happened and it wasn't just gunshots, it was bombs, which were even less controllable. You didn't have an opportunity to, uh, to know what was going on. And believe me, it was a major decision for people whether to stay inside and starve or go outside and take a chance and look for some food. Unfortunately, starvation was a constant battle. And uh, my mother used to say that because we had to live most of the time in the cellar underground, which were not developed for living conditions, they were where they stored wood for the winter heating. And it was cement floor, damp, no places where to sit. So staying down below was ready-made death uh, sick bed. And my mother used to say that I was always sick and sometimes I got better. And you must remember there was no medication, not enough food. So there was very little chance to get better. And she used to say, I was either sick or sicker. But looking at it with a very positive mind, like I always do, I think by building up my immunities, I'm a very healthy specimen now. And I'm 76 years old. And I think I'm in pretty good shape. And um, I try to also always look at life through positive eyes. So that's also positive attitude has a lot to do with how we are. Okay, another question. Why did the Germans kill people? Well, the Germans, as I mentioned earlier, wanted to have an Aryan pure race. In order to do that, they had to get rid of dark eyes, dark haired people, which many, most of the Jewish people represented. So they wanted to follow what Hitler wanted to do. And I must say, there were many, many people who were not as evil as some, but people became followers. Because you know how it is, sometimes you follow your friend, follow your uh, peers, you don't even know what you're doing, but you're just following to be with your friends. So even though there were many, many evil people, not everybody was evil to begin with. They just got caught up in it. All right, here we are. Were all Germans and Nazis bad people? Well, I didn't realize, but I answered the question. How did you explain to your kid that you were part of the war or did they just suspect it? Um, well, this is a very interesting question because my parents always told me that uh, they don't want me to dwell or anybody to dwell on anything bad we should put it in the back of our mind and uh, live for a better tomorrow. So consequently, when I had my daughter, and we have one daughter, uh, we never told her, and I never wanted her to know because I was, I will tell you in a minute, I was kidnapped in prison, and um, that was part of what I went through. I didn't want her to think that her mother could be in a similar predicament. So I never told my daughter anything from my background. And the only thing she knew was that I didn't care for dogs very much. Somewhat being afraid, but not so much, but just not liking dogs uh, who licked me and all that. And I will tell you in a minute how that all came about. But one more question. Oh, that's what, that was the question. So um, I just, wanted you to know that these were the war years and then things were difficult. And then uh, this was October, September, October. And in October, Eichmann came back again to Budapest because he needed more workers, more slaves for the um, uh, brick factories, the ammunition factories. Well, at that point, uh, they had a big, uh, pamphlet uh, spreading all over the city to help people to gather and come to this call up gathering place, which was an actual soccer field. Uh, and my mother, of course, was there by herself with her, her mother and two sisters. And they went to this soccer field. However, 
she had to leave me with two ladies in the building where we were because there was no one else and you couldn't take me to the gathering place. They knew that they were going to be taken probably to a camp. And sadly, my mother never knew whether she would see me again. So they gathered on this soccer field, the leftover Jewish community of Budapest. And her mother and two sisters were standing in this huge crowd. And suddenly a man came over to my mother and started pushing her out away from her mother and sisters. She had no idea where she was going, whether she was going to her death or where else. Well, it turned out this was an amazing, again, a wonderful humanitarian human being who pushed her out of the soccer field and when pushed her out, locked the gate after my mother and suddenly my mother found herself out in the in the open, in the so-called freedom to run. But at that moment, she ripped her yellow star off and decided to run back to where she left me. And fortunately, there I was. So that was my second attempt at survival at age six months. So now let me get to there a couple of questions. Uh, how long did the war last? And where was your father during this? Well, the war lasted, uh, well, it'll be close to a year, it'll be 10 months, and uh, things were not easy, and I will tell you a little bit after I answer the question about my father. My father was taken to a forced labor camp, but because of his business, uh, he was an indispensable person to the country. He was in the fire extinguisher firefighting business, and that business was indispensable for the survival of the country. So they protected him to some extent, and they used his knowledge and his expertise. So he was really in a, a somewhat privileged position, and he could come back out from the prison maybe for a day here and there, but he was always finding ways to survive, to manage to get on. But it was never uh, that he was there and he stayed consistently. So I just want to go back to that soccer field because it's an amazing story. My mother, to the day, the moment she died, she didn't know and couldn't figure it out. But her uh, thoughts were that this man probably could have been a father. And because this time was the time for nursing, she felt that her blouse probably had a damp or a wet patch around her nipples. And this man may have had a baby at home and he was a father who wanted to do something good to somebody. So here again, amongst all the bad, a wonderful person. So always realize that no matter how many bad people there are, there are always decent people around. Okay, what age were you when it was over and did you know anybody that fought in the war? Yes, we knew a lot of people and including my grandmother and my two aunts, although they didn't fight in the war, from that soccer field gathering place, they were also taken to concentration camps. They went to two camps in Germany, one of um, Bergen-Belsen and Ravensbrück, perhaps you will know this name. Bergen-Belsen has been in the, uh, some of the um, recent, not so recent, but in the last couple of years, one of the camps that the Americans uh, liberated. So that's where my aunts and grandmother were taken when fortunately my own mother was brought back and she was able to reunite with me. This was the middle of October and things as you can imagine were getting even worse. By the end of November, a ghetto was open because the Germans wanted to gather everybody in one place. So whatever they can do to hurt would be easy and we would all be in one location. So the ghetto opened, which you might be wondering with today's thinking, what would a ghetto be in those days? Today, you would say it's a geographical area where the same ethnic group of people live. Well, in those days, the ghetto was several square blocks 
and they built a wall around it. So it became more or less a prison. And a gate was locked, gun toting soldiers were standing guard, and people were allowed to leave only a couple of hours in the morning and maybe an hour or so in the afternoon. Again, we had practically no food and people had to make a decision whether to go out and risking getting killed because of the bombs falling or starving. It was a difficult decision. And of course, my mother could never go out because she had nobody to leave me with. So let me get the questions. What age were you when it was over? 10 months. Did you have any siblings? No, I was an only child. Did you ever see your dad? Well, of course, I didn't remember. I was too small of a baby to know. And uh, after the war was over was when my father came and he became father and daughter again. Uh, what age was your kid when she found out about this? Well, this is a very interesting situation. Uh, my daughter didn't know. And my daughter at that time, when I went to speak to her son at school, she was 36. And when she heard six different ways of telling the story, she just couldn't believe it. And believe it or not, it's still something that is hard for her to process. So these were the days, this is how we lived. And um, it was interesting for her to learn how we managed. And I think it's very important for people who had experiences in those days to make sure that the young generation knows about it. Because unfortunately in school, they're not teaching history the way it used to be since social studies combined history and geography. A lot of the historical facts were lost and very little is known about the uh, Nazi era. It's important to remember that you are fortunate to be able to listen to us. And once we are gone, we will not be here to tell the story firsthand. So I will ask you to please become better aware. You are going to be the ambassadors of information and you will know it firsthand. Once my generation, the young generation dies out, there'll be no firsthand experiences told to you. So feel that you are very lucky. Your teacher who brought you into the family of museum viewers and uh, you're very fortunate that you are exposed to this because you will be a better person. And I hope you will learn from my giving you a little information that the most important thing I want you to take home with you is no matter how many bad people there are, there are lots of decent people and always try to be one of those. So this brought me the end of November and uh, several questions were asked about my father. And uh, after a while, the Germans were uh, not taking anybody, uh, any Hungarian protection because uh, they've been part of the German Nazi uh, military sort. So my father was in a difficult position. He was escaping and trying to not get caught because people on the street were caught and it was a difficult time. By the beginning of December, he decided that all the escape and capture, escape and capture was enough. He couldn't take it any longer. He decided to go back to his factory where people were actually working without my father. And he was always a very resourceful, imaginative, creative person. They decided to fabricate for him a metal box. He was short, he was five foot one. And um, they fabricated this metal box, which they ended up putting nearby at the edge of a cemetery. This box looked like a coffin near a cemetery and they were hoping that nobody would come near there. He had paid one of the workers to come and bring some food at night when they could. But believe it or not, my father was staying in that metal box without much food at all, and certainly without warm clothing in the dead of winter in December for about six weeks 
until the end of the war. Believe it or not, the saying, where there's a will, there's a way, my father lived it every moment of his life. Well, things got worse, but thank God, by the end of January, Hungary got liberated by the Russians. And as welcome news that was, the Russians were not satisfied. They also wanted to stay and take over the country. But that fortunately did not happen. They left, but they didn't uh, put that out of their mind. They were still interested in the takeover. And during, this was in 1945, January, they decided to establish a little bit more of a foothold, uh, coalitions with organizations and parties. So they were working behind the scenes. However, for the Hungarian Jewish community that remained in Budapest, while there was euphoria that the war was over, bittersweet moments filled the air because everybody wondered whether their family members, will they come back? And if yes, when? You can imagine public transportation was all gone. There were no trains running. The train tracks, some of them were bombed. There were, of course, no buses. Transportation was a very, very difficult, problematic item. My grandmother and two aunts took months to come back to Hungary because they had to walk. They walked during the day and they found shelter under a door, under a gate somewhere, and tried to stay and rest overnight and then next morning started walking again. And unfortunately, I don't have a map, but little Hungary is in the middle and Germany was quite a distance and Poland where Auschwitz was another distance. So walking back was a big, big issue. So much so that my father-in-law had been taken to a Russian forced labor camp with his brother. And when they were liberated and were marching back to Budapest, it depended on the strength of your physical body, whether you could manage to get back. Unfortunately, my father-in-law's brother was in a much more delicate condition. He didn't make it, but my father-in-law fortunately arrived back into Budapest late, but at least arrived alive. And um, at the same time, my mother was fortunate that her mother and two sisters also arrived back by May or June, but my mother's sister and her six-year-old were in Auschwitz and were killed right away. So on his side, he was not that fortunate. Uh, there's a question. Did they eat anything? Um, I'm wondering uh, who the they were, maybe whether it was my father. Eating was a very problematic because their food was in very short supply and nobody had much to eat. All right, so then liberation came and things were doing well because people who were lucky enough to return wanted to reestablish their lives and um, they all worked and, you know, established their homes, got new things and bought things and life came to a very uh, successful way and a fulfilled time period. However, that didn't last very long because the, Germ the Russians decided to come back. And by 1948, just three years later, they had established their coalitions and their strength. And they had a, an election when their party won and the Russians came in and socialism came to Hungary. Socialism is the precursor to communism and it's the stage one. And that stage is one where they take away your private enterprises and no more individually run small businesses and the government took over. This was a major, major issue because as you can imagine, owners of small businesses were professionals. They knew how to run their business. But when the government took over, they put in a politician or somebody who represented the government 
they had no clue about how to run the business and many times the businesses for them. Okay, another question. Did your aunts eat anything during their walk? Well, I think there were also people who knew the predicament of these people. And there were people who helped them on the way and they were able to share, even if they got a half a loaf of bread, they shared it, the three of them. And at this point, I might say another very amazing thing, what happened after liberation. Many people have not seen food for months, at least a year, the Hungarians close to a year, and they couldn't get enough of what they saw. And the overeating was too much for their bodies. So believe it or not, after a year of starvation, they ate too much, their systems couldn't take care of it, and they died from overeating. So these are the kind of things that we don't realize what can happen and the consequences of certain incidents. So 1948 came in, socialism set in, and things were really difficult. And a lot of people decided to leave Hungary and uh, including my aunt and uncle who left in the early part of 1949, where they felt that things were getting worse and worse Socialism was getting more and more stringent and rigid, and they left and they went to Austria to the West. My parents and I could not leave because my father was in a major business. And believe, believe it or not, from the little Hungary, he was exporting firefighting equipment, fire extinguishers to Egypt. He felt that he had to fulfill his commitment he was a major reputable businessman and he just couldn't leave it in the lurch. And also he was hoping that at some point he will also, we will leave Hungary as well and he might be able to reconnect with his connections. So unfortunately we did not leave in 1949 early. By the end of 1949, my father, could read and see the handwriting on the wall and decided no matter what, we're going to leave. And he made all kinds of arrangements. And one of the interesting things, uh, border farmers who lived on the Austro-Hungarian border as established little side businesses of smuggling people across the border. And my father made arrangements with someone. He had all kinds of connections everywhere. And we made arrangements, we got on the train, we left, we went to the border town and uh, we arrived and through a code language, which was a way of life in Hungary, you couldn't always speak freely, not like we have freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Here, we had to be very careful who you spoke to and what you said. So my father, as we got off the train, through this code language, recognized each other, paid the man what he was supposed to get, and we got on his horse-drawn wagon. He was supposed to take us across the border, uh, ride in that clickety-clack um, wagon to the border where another person was going to take us across. Because you probably know a border is not a straight line, it zigzags, and there were some people who went across thinking they were in West, they were across into Austria and suddenly found themselves back in Hungary. So these were difficult times. And also the Russians put landmines and no one but the local farmers knew where and how to avoid them. So having one of these people who would smuggle you across was a necessity. Well, we were on this horse-drawn buggy late at night and without much delay, this man, instead of taking us to freedom, to the West, he was riding us, taking us to the authorities. At this point, I must say, it could have been that he was forced into doing that. It could have been that he had done many of these trips across the border and the authorities recognized what he had done 
and they had enough of it, they wanted to stop it. So unfortunately, it could have been that we were the scapegoats and we were the first ones. And instead of taking us to our freedom, it took us to the authorities. Well, this was a life-changing experience. Within a day, uh, we were imprisoned. And that's when, to go back to the kidnapping, uh, when the sentences were handed down, the prison guard kidnapped me from next to my mother. And for about two weeks, neither my parents know about, knew about me or I knew where they were. I was taken to an orphanage, a prison nursery, and my parents stayed there and they were in prison. My parents were in prison for my mother for eight months and my father for a year. And I spent it in the orphanage for about four or five months. Amazingly, uh, in prison, we were constantly checked by the doctor and we were used for experiments because they told us they were giving us injections to stay well. There were 18 of us children. And within a couple of days, every one of us came down with a different illness. They were using the same experimentations the Nazis did, the communists continued. So when I tell you that evil didn't end in World War II, here we are. I was a person who experienced it firsthand. So I don't want to give you too much detail of that, but it was pretty horrendous. And then finally, when my parents came back, we were reunited. And then five months later, another wonderful thing. By then, socialism turned into communism and the communists were grooming future leaders, and those future leaders had to be uh, very uninformed people from the little country. They were country bumpkins. They brought the country folk to the city where they didn't have enough apartments to house them. So people who had nice homes were displaced. And while the country bumpkins came to the city, we were taken to the country. And we were living under horrific conditions with no running water, no bathroom facilities indoors, things that you would only read about, we had to live. So it was not an easy life. And for 29 months, we did that. Living under those conditions was not an easy task. But my parents were always instilling in me and inspiring me that this is a temporary way and it'll get better. And Amazingly, I listened and believed in my parents and we were able to overcome. 29 months later, after Stalin, and you might not know Stalin, he was the leader of the Communist Party in Russia. When he died, we had an amnesty and we were released to go back to the city. But even then we were not able to live in the city. We had to live on the outskirts. Believe it or not, we were called parasites and they didn't want us to infect the city people with our knowledge. Because you have to remember under communism, there was no freedom of press. Although they had three newspapers, each one of them had the same story written differently. Nobody knew anything about the other person and nobody talked to anybody because you never knew who could be an agent for the government. So we lived under difficult conditions then there was a revolution that came in 1956. Uh, after incredible trials and tribulations, we were able to leave Hungary. And my aunt and uncle who left in 1949 early, they had moved to Australia and they were able to sponsor us. So we moved to Australia and we, I'm looking at my watch, and we were, um, um, we were moving to Australia and I was 13. And even though I didn't speak really English very much, although my parents had uh, a tutor for me at some point, we had to learn a new language, new culture, and new everything. So it really was a difficult time. And when I finished school in Australia, they have a unique system. High school is five years. And if after five years, you take one additional years, you can matriculate, which is the equivalent of college. 
So after that, when I finished that, because at some point I wanted to go to medical school, uh, things were just too difficult and problematic. And because Australia was such a down under, very far country, a lot of young women decided to go on what they called working vacations to England. Because as you know, Australia was part of the British Commonwealth. So we could go there and we were able to work and be part of it. Well, my friend that I befriended, she and I came to this country and we spent time in Los Angeles. And after she stayed here, I waited for another friend and went on. And in the meantime, I had contacted my old friends in Hungary because I knew there was a friend who lived here and uh, they wrote me and found out that um, this friend and his family lived in Cleveland and I contacted them and their mother told me that her son, the one that I was remembering, graduated from dental school and he's now in the US Navy and this was, in 1963. Uh, so we met in Chicago. He was in Great Lakes at the Naval Station. And uh, we met and then we spent time at his parents' house in Cleveland. And for whatever happened, proposed. And that was 56 years ago. And uh, after he went in the Navy, he was stationed in Port Wainemi, just north of Oxnard. And uh, then he was deployed to Guam and part of the Vietnam War. They were the first ones to land in uh, uh, Guam and building the first landing strip in Vietnam in 1964, April. After he got out of the Navy, we settled here in Los Angeles and we've been here ever since. And I just want you to know that I'm the luckiest person on earth that I can tell you all about it. And also there are a couple of questions and I will look at it. And I just want you to know that this is the most important thing to remember, to learn, be informed and stand for your conviction. And always remember, freedom is not free. You have to treasure it, respect it, never take it for granted. And most of all, never, never abuse it. Thank you for listening. And I certainly hope you've learned something. And I'm now going to go back to the questions so I can answer everybody's question. So you couldn't honor your culture. Well, that was a problem because I was too young. I left when I was 13. And Hungarians are very prolific. They were always very accomplished in music medicine, science, and uh, I still enjoy some of the things, but for me, this is my country, United States. Okay. Was it illegal to cross the border? Was it ever illegal? It was incredibly illegal. And as you could see in 49, at the beginning when my aunt and uncle did it, the border was a little more porous and not as well, um, uh, inspected and uh, guarded. But by the time we tried to escape, it was much more stringent. Uh, my book, uh, New I can, uh, the museum has my book, but also secondhand, you can go on Amazon and you will be able to find it, Pursuit of Freedom. And my name is Suzanne Rato, S-U-S-A-N-N-E-R-E-Y-T-O. And I certainly hope many of you will get it, read it, and pass it on to your friends so you will have a better knowledge of what, what the world experienced and really not that many years ago. All right, where, were you scared when you were not? Oh my God, was I ever scared when I wasn't with my parents? Can you imagine a five-year-old snatched from her mother and didn't have a clue where we were? It was awful. You can read more details in the book. When was the last time you have seen your aunt? Well, um, I don't know exactly. Um, at that time, I've seen my aunt when I left Australia. 
they lived in Australia and uh, she had children who are my cousins, actually my only cousins, and they live far away. Did they threaten you at the camp? Um, well, as I said, we weren't in a camp. What were you mostly feeling? Well, I tried to tell you how incredible it was to be separated from your parents as a five-year-old. And it was just an amazing, amazing thing. And I must also implore upon you, always listen to your parents. Even when you don't like what they say, they know better, they mean the best for you. And just listen to them and they will be your best caretakers. Okay, my name. Oh, my name. oh, what a lovely question. Thank you um, from Armando. Uh, he wants to thank. And as you interact with students, as you do, I wonder what gives you hope. Well, I don't know if there's enough time. Well, I'll tell you a very fast story. As I do speak to you, I speak at the museum, and normally I like to speak to young ones like you, sixth grade. And one day they asked me if I would speak to high schoolers, high school graduates. And there's a group from Fullerton at the college where they have a program for first uh, college-bound students. And during the summer, they give them an extracurricular activity of visiting different institutions of history and culture and all that. Well, the 85 high school graduates came and I spoke to them and I told them the story and told them the uh, inspirational story of my survival and my attitude toward life of full of hope. And when it was all over and everybody was very happy, the professor, the director of the program came back to me and I thought, oh my God, did I do something wrong? And he says, I just want you to know, thank you for what you did. And I have to tell you that you probably changed the lives of 85 young people forever. I was just blown away. I said, what happened? What did I say? He said, everything you said was amazing, but one word made a huge difference, survivor. And if you, with coming from the so-called ashes, and you were able to rise above and survive and thrive, they have every bit of inspiration to survive themselves. So if you think of what is hope and what fuels me to do more, an incident like that is enough to fuel me for a very long time. Thank you for that question. How do you, how do you feel about talking about your story to others? Well, that is a, an interesting subject because I never spoke about it till about the time when my book came out because I felt I had to. If my mother was inspired enough to tell the story because she felt it was important to tell young people what we experience, I felt it's my job to carry on my mother's mission. So I started to speak and I must tell you, it is not always easy. And sometimes it breaks me, but I'm happy to do it. Me too. Well, this is a cute question. Did you become famous when you got lucky that you escaped? Well, we were just thrilled to have escaped and we didn't worry about anything. And um, have you ever seen your cousins? Yes. I have seen my cousins. We have visited Australia and they've come here. So we see each other, but very rarely. And uh, how have you, have you, second time sharing that? Well, that is a very interesting question. Um, how did my life experiences mold me? As I said earlier, it is my parents who made sure that they were always there to support, inspire, and strengthen me and to give moral support. And they always said, always use the bad experiences to strengthen you. Don't let it weaken you. And maybe that's another message that I want to leave with you. Every experience you learn from, 
and make sure that that becomes a positive experience. I think that's um, that's the question. That was the last question. And I'm very, very happy uh, with all your questions. And I thank you for listening. And I hope I inspired you to uh, learn more and become better informed. So thank you and take good care and absolutely stay healthy during this stay at home period. Thank you again so much, Suzanne. We're so honored to have you here to speak with these students. And I thank all of you for your very thoughtful and insightful questions. And I'm so glad that you learned um, whenever it's safe. We just don't have an exact date, of course, but whenever it's safe, we hope you come to the museum with your families and you can learn a lot more. But in the meantime, we're happy we're able to give you this opportunity. And thank you so much, Suzanne, for volunteering your afternoon to speak with these students. So thank you and stay safe. And we hope to see you at the museum sometime in the near future. Thank you. Bye.